in the meeting and I'll take this adherent of the Equal Opportunities Forum held on the 29th of March 2023. Um, I can see Councillor Kalikas, are you present? No. I can see that we have present Councillors Clark, Corbett, Ferguson. I have apologies for, from Councillor McAdams. Also present today are Councillors McGeever, Razak and Rob. Councillor Salamati? No. Councillor Thompson? I can see that you are present remotely. We also have a number of officers in attendance today and with that I'll pass you back to the Chair to commence today's meeting. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you very much. Right. Okay. Um, Bert, do you want to speak? Well, he's came off. Okay. Okay, we'll move on. We'll go to the minutes of the previous meeting, pages three to six. Are there any questions? Everyone agreed? Oh, apologies. Oh. Um, right. we'll, so, can we pass that? Okay. Okay, I'll go. Um, I think I'm going backside the um, Barcelona Railway here. Um, decorations of interest? It's none. Okay. And can I can I ask? We don't have. We don't do action points in uh, mini meetings. Is it possible to have action points on meetings? Has everyone agreed to that? Because at least it'll be a way of keeping track of anything we want to discuss. Yeah. Is there any objections to that? It's not an objection, but but the forum decided part is normally where you would record if there were specific actions for for anybody resulting from the meeting. Right. You could just just include it within the bit that the forum decided. Right. Yeah, that would be great. I mean, if we have a box with it to say that you know when it's been dealt with and everything else, it's just it just keeps track of all the all the subjects we are talking about more than anything else. That would be great. Agenda uh, item three, the annual report on mainstreaming equalities and diversity, uh, community and enterprise resources, page 7 to 32. Can I invite Alison Brown? Yes. Oh, sorry, apologies. It's Gail Forrest, I'm um, support team leader. Thank you, Chair, for that. Uh, so I'm here today to present the annual report on the mainstreaming equalities and diversity for community and enterprise resources. So page seven of the report at section 1.1 outlines the purpose of the report, which is to update the Equal Opportunities Forum of the strategic and operational work being undertaken and planned by community and enterprise resources to meet the commitments within the mainstreaming, mainstreaming Equalities Report 2021 to 2025. At section 2.1, Recommendations, the forum is asked to approve the following recommendations that the work being undertaken by community and enterprise resources in terms of mainstreaming equalities be noted. Moving on to section three, which provides the background. 3.1, in April 2021, the council published its mainstreaming equalities report 2021 to 2025. There are five equality outcomes set for 21-25 and community and enterprise resources lead on equality outcome two which is to ensure that older people, those from vulnerable groups and individuals who live alone are protected from scams and nuisance calls and their well-being is improved through increased awareness and preventative action. This has been progressed by Environmental Services Consumer and Trading Standard Services and quarterly updates are provided to the Corporate Equality and Diversity Forum. Progress is also noted in our appendix at items 8 and 9. Moving over to page eight at section 3.2, progress of activity along with the differences each activity has made is detailed in appendix one, which is attached to the report. Community and enterprise, the quality activities aligned and reported against the council plan connect themes, which are listed in the report and also within the appendix. Section 3.3, the resource has an in-house equality opportunities working group, which includes officers from each service. That group meets quarterly. Moving on to section four, which summarises the work that's undertaken in relation to equalities impact assessments. 4.2, 
During 2022, the resources completed two equality impact assessments in relation to sustainable development climate change strategy and also social enterprise strategy. In relation to training and development, there is also going to be some training in terms of the equality impact assessment system, which is pending an upgrade, our replacement, and our representatives who enter the information into that will be either receiving new or refreshed training for that system during next year. That's not noted in the report, but I just wanted to cover that. Section 5, that covers the comfort scheme pilot. Um, on the 13th of December 2022, it was reported to Enterprise Community and Inspired Resources Committee that the following the closures of the Council's public conveniences, a, um, sorry, a comfort scheme pilot was launched in line with the Business Improvement District for Lanark. The comfort scheme enabled local authorities to work in partnership with local businesses to provide access for the public to clean, safe and accessible toilets in local business premises with a small annual fee provided. Moving over to page 9 at section 5.3, the evaluation of the pilot high highlighted high administrative costs for the Council and challenges in determining usage of the scheme. For these reasons, it was decided not to continue with the scheme. Following the committee decision, Lanark Business Improvement District, known as Discover Lanark, advised they would discuss this at a future board meeting to consider any further options that may be available. Section 6 provides an update on the open space strategy. Preparation of an open space strategy and audit is one of the requirements of the Planning Scotland Act. The Act specifically requires the quality of access to open space to be assessed and also requires significant public engagement to be undertaken. The preparation of the OSS is a significant project which will have major resource implications for the Council in terms of staff time and expertise. It's therefore proposed that consultants are appointed to undertake elements of the work required and funding from the Council's climate change has been secured to take this work forward in order to meet the deadline of March 2024. Work is currently ongoing, which involved identifying open space provision in South Lanarkshire and assessing relevant sites in terms of equality and accessibility. Uh, that's currently ongoing in March 2023. A full programme of community engagement across South Lanarkshire will be undertaken on the audit and strategy. Section 7 through to 11 provide our standard updates in relation to employment, training and development. And moving to section page 13 of the documents, that's the beginning of our appendix, uh, which outlines the ongoing operational and strategic activities undertaken by the services. As I mentioned at section 3.2, these are all based on the Council Connect themes listed as 1 to 6 on the page, and the updates are provided in terms of the operational activities that have been carried out by the operational services, which are also referenced in there. I would like to point out one note at the bottom there. Our last report to the forum was in September 21, which was towards the end of the COVID pandemic, but it did have an impact on some of our service provision, care of garden schemes, etc. So the statistics that we've provided in this report, they may cover different date periods, but it's just we wanted to give an up-to-date position on, on what the, the figures were. Um, so hopefully you'll find them useful. So in conclusion, I would recommend that the members of the forum note the content of the report as approved and would welcome any questions if anyone has any. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. Are there any questions? Okay. Councillor Clark. Yeah, uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, page 9, 7.1.2, uh, it says there in relation to people who declared, declared a disability, only one appointment was, uh, was made or accepted when 10 were offered a post. Do we know why that is and if there's anything we can do to improve that number? Thanks. Okay. Uh, thank you and thank you, thank you for that question. As it happens, uh, you'll be aware we've been looking at some of these posts in, in a little bit of detail. So um, we do know we've got within community and enterprise resources, particularly in some of the frontline roles, a lot of posts being offered but not necessarily taken up. Um, so we could look at the relatively small number that's uh, taken within there and provide some analysis because it's a small number to then go and track. But I suspect um, that'll be that'll be the reason, and that's why ten were offered. 
um, and one was, uh, was appointed, uh, the others will have either withdrawn to the process because they've, they've been successful in getting something else. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It'd be, be useful to know the, the reasons for them not accepting those and, and if there's anything extra we can do, but thank you. Thank you. Uh, and, uh, Councillor Thompson. Chair, Chair. Uh, two, two quick points. First, I'm thank, thankful for the report and a lot of positives, but the one with the toilets, for example, we an elderly population. I think it's a bit concerned that they're closing. There are no future plans to open them up. And the thing they did try never worked. The other one was uh, open spaces. Uh, we've got to consult again. We seem to consult and consult and consult and nothing really happens. I'm disappointed there, especially when people know they want open spaces. They want pieces of equipment with, for kids with a disability, for example. They want, want that, but the, the, the far as I know, there's no money to improve areas and there's no money to open new ones. Is that correct? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. In terms of uh, the open space audit, it is a requirement of the Planning Scotland Act in terms of the consultation, and um, it's it's important that that is is done, and new residents to areas have the opportunity. Um, to, to feed into that. In terms of um, provision of new open space, there is, in certain areas, developer contributions, and sometimes those can be targeted towards um, specific um, opportunities around open space, play provision, etc. So, happy to take any specific points you have offline um, and, you know, to, to work with you um, if there is anything specific. Thank you. Yeah, do you want to come back in? No, just to say, to say thanks for that. that uh, how do we, well, we'll talk offline, safe taking time at the meeting, because I'd like to know how we could approach the developers, because I've approached them twice and never get any positive response. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Rob. Thank you. Uh, just really interesting report, really comprehensive, and it must have been a large piece of work as well to pull it all together. Um, a few points of interest, and a, a wee question as well. Um, I noted in page nine that the um, about the open space strategy and so on, and we noted from the police plan that we approved this morning that the police are going to be doing a consultation about women and girls' feelings on safety in public spaces, and I wondered if there's going to be some crossover in terms of learning from what's coming out of the... Well, it's a, a multi-agency consultation that the police will do so hopefully they'll talk to you when you're doing your open space strategy that's good um, the second one is on page 25 um, in the appendix uh, about the the nicotine uh, contraversions of nicotine legislation and um, that's quite a high uh, percentage of contraventions isn't it visiting 63 businesses and 55 contraventions so it's just to see what action would be taken off the back of that um, and the final point as well, I noted the training on equalities for the staff that's available. I just wondered what training on equalities is going to be made, made available for councillors and to try and get as many councillors as possible, because I know equalities can change from year to year. And I think it'd be good to get the councillors up to speed on that. Yeah, th thanks uh, for, the, for the question. We are uh, actually in the middle of updating again uh, our online offering round about equalities because you're right, it does change very frequently. We'll make the same offer out to elected members in terms of the, the content, so it'll be there uh, and available for all. Thank you. Okay, um, can I ask a question? Uh, sorry. Um, are you? Uh, no, I was thinking about Come back to the point on uh, page 25 about the tobacco. Um, just recently, a couple of weeks ago, I was at a meeting with Consumer and Trade and Standards and the Equal Opportunities representative on our uh, working group had said that that's been expanded not only to cover that, but to cover vaping and things like that. So they're just about ready to embark on some checks and things on local business premises and they will be taking forward anything that they, that they find during those visits. So hopefully that gives you the comfort you were looking for for that one. Okay, thank you. Um, just two questions. So a quick one for Gail. Um, I think the the wee regulations are kicking in in uh, April, the start of April for vaping, and uh, it's just just to see um, what the council will be doing when they're proposing the premises and uh, 
just that I think a lot of retailers don't understand the regulations, and I think there's a, there's a bit of work being required there. And the second thing is, is for Kay, um, my question is, uh, have you got any figures on if uh, what 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 um, uh, work groups the um, the councillors have sat any work that they've sat for any of the online training? Sorry. Yeah, so so we can readily run reports out the system. Um, I think we've been back uh, previously to group leaders to explain uh, what learning and development individual members have uh, under undertaken, particularly around about some of the the key areas that we've felt were really important. So we can we'll wait till the end of the financial year and and do that again. That would be good. Even if you can get a general one, that would that would be good just to um to see as just what the uptake is on the training. Yeah, certainly can. Yes. Kirsten. Yeah, on you go, Kirsten. It was just to ask when you expect the new training to be ready. <laughs> if you can put a time scale on that, that'd be... Thank you. There, there was a question I don't I immediately have the answer, <laughs> answer to. I do know that it's currently in development because there was a little update to one of our uh, joint consultative committees the other day, but I, I don't have the date to hand, but I can certainly circulate that later. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. okay. Uh, Councillor Ferguson. Grant, that's you. Yes. Can you give us sound, please, to the chamber? Yes, we can hear you. Is it, work, is it working? Oh, can you hear me, Chair? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, we were speaking about disability. Oh, the sounds went. Can I check the sound again with you, Chair? The sound's working now, but it seems to be when I'm uh, on grant signing, then it seems to come um, tail away. Okay, so can, can, we, can we start again? Okay, thank you, Chair. So um, we were speaking about the disability and equality training. I feel very strongly that deaf awareness should be included in that. Um, the British Deaf Association um, had found over the past um, period that the deaf awareness uh, training was very sparse in its availability. So I would really like to see the deaf community um, have that confidence that their elected members are participating in this mm -hmm. kind of training, awareness training. Um, thank you, Chair. Okay. And, yeah, yeah. Can we will get an update for that grant? Thank you very much. Any other questions? No. Okay, we'll go on to agenda item four. It's uh, transport network accessibility, and the presentations by Stuart Laird. Thank you very much, Chair, for the invitation to to come along this afternoon. Um, this presentation will inform the forum of the types of engineering measures that can be implemented to ensure that there are reduced barriers to accessing the transport network. In terms of background, in order to create and maintain accessible public realm, it's critical to ensure that disabled people, for example, um, are not excluded from participating and playing a full role in society. Therefore, um, our officers um, consider numerous design documents when considering details of maintenance and improved schemes. Um, and a selection of these are uh, on the um, screen um, at the moment. Um, the documents themselves um, have been pulled together by various different organisations, such as the Department of Transport. And these uh, such sort of national bodies um, have put in a lot of effort to 
investigating um, and undertaking assessments to come up with various criteria that um, ourselves as engineers um, um, look to implement. Um, and it really comes down to the um, accessibility needs of all people to ensure that they are met. And centre to that is the, uh, is, is the Equality Act 2010. The other documents that are on the screen here um, are things that we have used, like the Design Manual for Roads and Bridges. Um, and just to put that into context, that is um, a significant document that, that the Department of Transport have introduced over a number of years, and it, it, it goes to um, over 10 volumes, um, and it covers all aspects of roads design. We've also looked at what happens abroad, um, Holland, for example, when we're looking at new infrastructure for cycling and walking. We've also considered what happens um, down south in England, um, looking at what London do for their cycle design, for example. And we also consider what is available to us here in Scotland. So Transport Scotland have introduced a document uh, fairly recently, uh, an update on an older document called Cycling by Design. And all of that has got lots of design information. And one of the best documents that we use um, is uh, called uh, Inclusive Mobility. Uh, and that's, uh, it's a guide to best practice on access to pedestrian and tr uh, transport infrastructure. And the remainder of the presentation have taken out um, some of the main themes from that document, um, which I'll take you through now. When we look at footways, footpaths and pedestrian crossings, um, these are obviously facilities that are key to ensure that the network is appropriate for all types of users. And there are many techniques that the designer incorporates into new facilities. So things like tonal and colour contrasts, and as you can see from the images here, um, you can see where there are different colours um, and different contrasts from, um, fr fr from where people are expected to cross. Um, in addition to that, we look at um, the widths um, of footways, for example, um, the height of adjacent signs or other um, parts of infrastructure to ensure that, um, for example, wheelchair users can pass each other. Um, and any pedestrians avoid any, any overhead features. We also consider the gradient of footways and footpaths, again, to ensure that uh, wheelchair users, for example, or people with um, the, the, the use of stick or crutches can easily navigate their way about. We also introduce guardrails. Um, these can protect pedestrians from adjacent slopes um, or, or other hazards as well. We like to incorporate seating uh, within our town centres, for example. Uh, again, um, these are provided at relevant um, and frequent intervals to ensure that people uh, with mobility impairments have, um, have a chance to stop and rest. We also try and avoid shared, shared routes. Um, an example of that is um, trying to segregate out pedestrians from cyclists, for example. Um, and again, these areas create um, a better environment for, for people to move about in. When it comes to street furniture, um, items such as lighting columns, signposts, bollards, waste bins, etc., uh, these should um, obviously be uh, located out with um, areas where they could present a hazard for people with visual impairments. Surface materials is, is, is also a consideration to ensure that uh, these are smooth. Um, and um, looking to maintenance in the future, they're easy to replace as well. When we're looking at um, corridors, um, we, we try and relocate um, any potential hazards out with pedestrian areas. We also need to incorporate pedestrian crossing facilities. And as you can see from the um, images on the screen at the moment, um, we have different types of crossings. We've, we've got zebra crossings. Um, some, some of those incorporate cycle as well as pedestrian facilities uh, and an image at the bottom shows a token crossing which is there for um, pedestrians and cyclists to use and in addition to that um, we also have drop curbs uh, and raised crossings and these um, again benefit those with mobility impairments moving to tactile paving surfaces um, these play an important role uh, as they convey information to visually impaired people who can detect with their feet or, or with a cane different um, surface types. So there are six 
um, that are um, used within this country. Um, and they have got different texture and they convey different messages depending on the type. So there's five that are generally used within the public road network and there's a sixth which is generally used uh, within the rail network. So the first image um, I'm on the screen at the moment shows, shows um, blister paving and this is used at pedestrian crossing points. And it's L-shaped um, at uh, control crossing points which directs people to where the push button is. Um, so, so, the, so the tactile paving itself um, is made up of, uh, of rows um, um, as well as um, depth into the heel of the footway. We also use corduroy paving and there's two different kinds of those. Um, the first is um, a, closed, um, a close ribbed arrangement uh, and that is used uh, where there's potential hazards uh, such as steps. The image at the bottom of the screen uh, shows corduroy paving that's got a wide ribbed arrangement. Um, and that is used um, in our um, sh um, segregated cycle track networks. Other ones that are available um, are round curved ribbed paving, uh, and these are used as a guide um, to um, take people along a route um, where there um, are queues, um, um, etc., to try and um, form a line through, um, such as um, a property line or an edge of curb line. Other um, types of paving that are available um, relate to um, sorry, public transport um, interchanges. So we've got on-street pr pr provision and there's a platform edge type of paving uh, and those are used um, at trams, um, particularly um, in this country. If you look to Edinburgh, they, they'll have um, that kind of paving at their tram stops. The other one that most people will be familiar with will be um, platform edge paving um, that's used at railway stations. Uh, and again, um, if, you, if you're in Glasgow Central, have a look along the platforms and you'll see the platform edge, um, edge paving there. In terms of cycle facilities, um, we ensure that these are accessible for all. Um, it's becoming more common um, for people to use um, the bike as a mobility aid, um, which helps them get around, um, or it could um, help them um, carry items um, um, or even passengers. Uh, as such, uh, all cycling infrastructure should be coherent, it should be safe, direct and comfortable, um, as well as um, being in appropriate um, locations for, uh, for accessible use. Um, neither its design nor its position should, should um, create hazards, particularly for vulnerable pedestrians. To maximise the inclusiveness of cycle facilities, um, the Minimisation of effort should be um, a key design consideration. So therefore factors such as gradient, cycle parking facilities, signing, traffic camming, surface materials, as well as the design of the corridor in and around bus stops, um, these are all key factors. Car parking um, is, is, is one that's important as well because um, anyone with mobility issues um, um, can, can use a car. Um, now, car parking itself should be accessible uh, and easy to use. Um, it should have designated available spaces close, um, as close as possible to the main entrances of the facilities there to serve, um, or close to sh um, shop front doors, um, etc. So, in addition to the location, um, a suitable number of disabled spaces uh, should be provided as well. And the size um, in and around um, the car parking space itself is also considered and where necessary a zone around these um, should, should allow easy access and egress um, from, from vehicles. Um, in addition to that, we would also um, seek to have drop curb um, access arrangements to allow people in wheelchairs to manoeuvre to and from their vehicle. Moving to bus stops, um, accessibility and boarding places for buses is obviously important, uh, particularly if you have a, have a mobility impairment, to make sure that you can uh, board and alight uh, from this um, mode of transport. There's quite a lot um, of things to be considered, uh, such as the maximum spacing um, in between bus stops, particularly in urban areas, uh, and this ensures that um, uh, there are suitable points uh, for buses to stop close to people's homes. We also locate um, opposite bus stops, uh, we make sure that they are staggered, usually tail to tail, and this allows buses to move away from each other where, where there are pedestrians likely to be crossing. 
We also have been introducing uh, raised border areas, and these allow people with mobility issues um, or in wheelchairs to easily um, access um, the, the bus itself. Um, where there's high numbers of pedestrians um, um, uh, uh, and sorry, passengers, then we would look to um, um, introduce shelters, um, and these have adequate space around them so that those people that are waiting um, don't be in a position where they're blocking pedestrians that are passing as well. Uh, where there are shelters, um, we, we have a look at um, the opportunity to provide seating within these, uh, and um, all, all bus stops, shelters, etc., are, um, are located where, where buses are likely to stop to make boarding uh, and egress a lot easier. We've also been introducing passenger information, such as timetable information or real-time bus information um, um, at um, bus stops as well. And again, these are all messages to, to, to encourage the, the use of public transport. What's on screen at the moment um, is uh, um, a number of uh, the points that we've been discussing in relation to um, tactile paving, um, the boarding heights, etc. Um, and what you're seeing here is a cycle bypass. So this is where um, anyone waiting in a bus um, is taken um, to, a, to a designated point uh, and away from any passing cyclists. Moving on to traffic signal control junctions and pedestrian crossings, um, we recognise that in urban environments it's, it, it's crucial that we have um, cr um, appropriate crossing points. Um, and in, in addition to some of the measures that we've been um, discussing earlier this afternoon um, in, in this presentation, there are several aids um, that um, people with mobility, vision uh, and hearing impairments um, have got um, facilitated within, within our traffic signal network. Um, ones um, I'm going to concentrate on um, is the push button units itself. Uh, these are, are of an approved design. They are internally illuminated with a tactile cone on the underside, which rotates when pedestrians are, signals, are signaled to cross. Audible tones are also provided where there's no conflicting crossing stages nearby. Uh, and the, the location and height of the unit itself is within easy reaching distance of the waiting area. The image on the right hand side. Um, shows um, an extract from some of our design guidance, and this um, shows um, the sort of full design cycle of um, of a pedestrian crossing. So, crossing times for pedestrians um, are set using nationally applied criteria. An invitation to cross green figure time um, is based on average walking speed as well as the width of the road. Following from that green figure, um, there's a um, a period where Pedestrians and all our traffic are showing a red signal, which allows anyone who's started to, to cross sufficient time to complete the crossing itself. While on the crossing, pedestrians are aided by on-crossing detectors, which can extend the all-red period I've just de de described, if necessary. And finally, um, in terms of conclusions, um, the measures described this afternoon have been implemented in projects and these have seen improvements to accessibility of the network. Um, we also have undertaken public engagement exercises, um, which provides opportunities to identify um, any parts of the network where, where there are issues, as well as commenting on the concept of some of our designs. And finally, um, accessibility features and measures remain an, uh, an integral part of the, the design of all of our new projects. I'll pass back to you, Chair, and I'm Happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you, Stuart. Is there any questions? Yes, is this Bert? Stuart, sure, fantastic, fantastic result. No, I'm getting a lot of echo there. I hope you can hear me okay. Uh, two quick questions. One is, these things look really good. What's the sort of plan, the budget, to implement them out, uh, out more, more in South Lanarkshire? Because it'd be good in a lot of areas. The second one was, I don't think you mentioned drop-down kids. Can we look at that again? A lot of people with walking aids, disabilities, etc. I think we'd appreciate that. Thanks, Stuart. Thanks, Stuart. I think our drop-down curbs were mentioned, Bert. Oh, sure. Yeah, in terms of plans um, and budget, um, that's a $50 million question, I suppose. Um, we have been pulling together active travel studies um, for all of our main towns. Uh, and villages, and we're just about to have um, the sort of final pieces of of, of that jigsaw um, 
delivered to us by, um, by a consultant. And within each of those um, study areas, um, we have developed a network um, for both um, cycling and walking. Um, and one of the main reasons for that is to allow us to demonstrate to um, external funding partners where um, we, we, we actually have a plan to, to demonstrate that we've been through a process, and that process includes a consultation with, uh, with, with our communities, um, and it identifies the issues, identifies what, what, what the concerns are, um, and from that um, we can then um, ask where the priorities should be. And then from that process, um, we have been engaged with um, Sustrans, uh, and SPT, um, those are our two main um, points of um, external funding, um, as well as Transport Scotland. Um, and because we have these documents, we can really start to um, show that, that we've got a, a clear way forward for, for, for each of our towns. Um, and we have levered funding um, for de de designs um, in, in most of our um, main conurbations now. So um, once we have these designs brought forward to um, um, in a suitable stage, um, then um, we'll, we'll then be applying for, for funding. And most of um, the funding that, that, that we use um, is um, from Transport Scotland and Sustrans. And, and there's been quite a push over, over recent years where um, the funding available to local authorities ha um, has increased significantly. And I'm obviously keen that, that we get our sh fair share of that for South Lanarkshire. Um, and your final point in relation to, to drop curbs, um, I did an exercise recently um, where, I, where I measured the, the length of the road network, um, and it stretches from um, more or less Hamilton all the way to, to, to Madrid, which is a fair distance if you had to walk it. Um, and about half of that has, has um, a footway attached to it as well. So you can see that there's it's a huge, huge length of network that we have, and a lot of it is is historic. Um, and where we are um, taking forward projects, um, I, can, I can use East Kilbride as an example, um, where we've been um, implementing um, improved cycle and walking infrastructure on West Mains Road, and we've been implementing um, drop curbs um, um, as part of that project as well as improving street street lighting. Um, trying to improve the um, the experience for for all types of road users um, um, that, that use that particular corridor. When it comes to some of our resurfacing projects and footway works, um, we we ensure that um, that's an opportunity to, to introduce new drop curve facilities where, where ones haven't um, existed in the past. And finally, um, with any new development, um, so developments over the last. 50 um, years almost um, have, um, have um, all new development, um, residential developments, for example, ha um, have included um, drop curb curbs at uh, junctions and, and at other suitable locations as well. So um, I'll pass back to you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Chair. Bert, do you want to come back before I bring Mark in? Just quickly, just a, a sure. I thought I thought I heard you say there in the same sentence, funding and increase. So that was welcome. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you, Bill. And Mark? Thanks very much, Chair. Um, <clears throat> and thanks as well, Stuart, for the for that uh, presentation. Um, I'm looking at the picture number seven, um, which is, I think, West Mains Road. And it actually brings up something uh, that I'd randomly stumbled across yesterday, actually. It was a BBC London news item, and it was the mayor there's coming in for quite a bit of criticism for, on both fronts from... Um, from cyclists and pedestrians regarding the use of sort of floating island bus stops. Now, I, I confess there was no solutions forthcoming in this report, and I, I didn't, uh, I couldn't think of any myself. I think it must be very difficult to cater for all users when you design these things. But I notice in, in West Mains Road here, we have used this sort of thing, but effectively you have a, a bus stop between, sandwiched between the, the main road carriageway and the dedicated cycleway. Um, and knowing this particular area, I don't think that's likely to be a problem, but I'm just wondering if we are going to adopt this sort of thing where you and maybe more densely you know, used pieces of the road network or the cycle network, we would be forcing pedestrians to cross 
a live cycleway in order to access a, a bus stop. Um, with all obvious implications for um, people who are visually impaired, amongst others. And I know you'd mentioned that, that particular group's needs quite a few times there. I'm just wondering if we are going to roll out this sort of usage, do we do we talk to the, the Royal National Institute for the Blind or, or anyone else about the kind of the issues that might uh, present there? And um as I said the mayor was actually getting it from both sides. He was getting uh, from cyclists as well, I think, who were concerned about pedestrians rushing for a bus, stepping out right in front of them, giving them no opportunity to stop. So uh, I think it's uh, you know kind of reasonable points in both in both sides really. But I, I don't know what the solutions would be. I'm just wondering if we are going to use this sort of, or we are open to using this uh, solution. Do we do we consider the issues that that go along with it? Uh, and secondly, it was also with regards to the use of zebra crossings, which I noticed are. Um, have been deployed in, in East Kilbride uh, quite a bit around there. Um, and I actually think they're, they're great things. However, I'm, I did notice that there doesn't seem to be any tones. So again, I'm wondering for people who uh, would maybe have a visual impairment, how are they uh, able to manage this? Um, uh, it's not something I'm familiar with. I don't know if we, we use uh, any kind of tactile signage to, to alert them. So cheers. Well, there's quite a few things there. I'll hopefully try and get through them. Sorry. <laughs> so apologies <laughs> if I miss any out. Um, in terms of the designs, um, a lot of these have been um, on trial, not 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 necessarily in in, in this country itself, but um, um, on mainland Europe as well. So um, you remember the, one of the first slides that I showed. Um, it, it showed a a circle of different different documents. Um, the, that, that we use when it comes to designing um, the network. And um, we, we've introduced um, a couple of these types of arrangements within South Lanarkshire, um, and other local authorities are introducing them as well. And I think it's, it's, it's probably a case of when you put in something new, there is that sort of bedding in period where people need to get used to a particular new, new, new arrangement. And b before um, any any of these new features uh, appear on the ground, th th there is always um, a, a, um, a, a sort of assessment period. And um, so, the, the Department of Transport, for example, b before they issue um, in many documents, a lot of it is um, based on um, experience of of introducing pilot schemes. So, the Traffic Re Research Laboratory um, um, is an example of that, and that dates back. Um, to the 60s, where um, a lot of um, design criteria started to develop from. Um, so, when it comes to um, sort of consultation with uh, with um, sort of groups like 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 you mentioned, um, they've already been through um, that process um, in terms of um, being talked to by the Department of Transport about any new types of infra um, infrastructure. Uh, and its design as well. So um, I hope that gives you a bit of comfort that um, things don't just appear on the ground. Um, th there is a bit of uh, um, design uh, uh, analysis done um, um, way before it actually um, gets put within a design document again, before it gets put put, put on the ground. Um, the second point in regards to zebra crossings. Um, zebra crossings, um, it's a... It's, it's always been that was probably the first type of crossing um, that was introduced um, um, for pedestrians. Um, the, the, some of the images that um, um, I had shown in the presentation showed a combined pedestrian um, and cycle crossing, um, and again that that is um, a new um, a new piece of infrastructure. Um, and again, when we're looking at um, the types of crossing, um, we we obviously look at um, the location itself. What its impact would be and how people people would use it. So um, a lot of the um, zebra crossing infrastructure, you'll see it's got the black and white pole with the globe on it. It's got um, the road markings themselves. It's got um, studs um, to identify the crossing areas. It's got drop curbs, tactile pavings, and and all, all of these are um, are messages um, that um, are given out to um, someone with an impairment. Um, how, 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 how and where they can cross. And I, I did an interesting um, piece of analysis where I compared zebra crossings to puffin crossings. Um, and there isn't necessarily a correlation of, of them being uh, unsafe. 
um, and when you compare one against the other, um, you, you, there are very few accidents at these types of crossings, but those that do um, happen, um, there isn't necessarily um, one safer, safer than, than the other. So I hope that's answered um, your questions. Yeah, cheers. Okay. Yes, uh, Councillor Rob, question. Thank you. I've still got the image in my head, Stuart, of you measuring South Lanarkshire's roadways from here to Madrid. That will be a nice long beer in Madrid's cafe at the end of that. Um, but my question is, uh, that's fantastic to see those changes happening on the ground, and I'm sure they'll make a, a huge difference as well. Um, I wanted to ask for a wee update on where the Council is um, on the reducing the speed to 20 mile an hour in where people live, uh, because I think that would help to give people assurance that it's safer to walk out, uh, whether you know, you've got an inequalities issue or not. Thank you. Yeah, that's um, um, obviously um, when we're trying to create safer places, um, the speed of traffic is one that um, is always talked about. Um, we have um, got funding um, to take forward um, um, an, an assessment of all our roads within um, built-up areas. Um, and um, a consultant on board um, has been appointed, um, and I'm expecting to get um, um, a draft document probably within within the coming weeks now, as opposed to months. Um, and then once we, we um, get that information back from the consultant, we will then um, obviously review it, and the intention would be to... Um, see what the outcome of that is and present it to the Council's Road Safety Forum at some point, probably later on this uh, uh, this calendar year. And again, just for a bit of background, um, the, the uh, National Transport Strategy uh, for Scotland um, um, identified various aspirations, and, and, and one is to reduce um, speeds within build-up areas to 220 miles an hour. And that actually correlates very nicely to our own local transport strategy as well, where we identified that some 10 years ago, that we wanted to move move, move towards that. So um, I'm, I'm hoping that um, once we identify what it is we want to do, um, we'll then start to move towards implementation of 20 mile per hour speed limits within our built up areas. How that will look and when it will happen, I can't say at this moment in time, um, but the year 2025 is, it has been dangling in front of us um, um, as a particular target. Um, but obviously, re resources are going to be dependent on <coughs> whether that's met or not. <coughs> Ross Clark. Thanks, Chair, and thank you, Stuart, for that report. Uh, for many neurodivergent people, a change in the road or pavement layout or signage can be distressing or confusing. Uh, is this something we take into account in our plans in terms of inequalities issue? Thanks. Uh, one of the things that we do, and East Kilbride is probably a good example from the point of view of that we've taken something from a design concept um, to actually build it on the ground. Um, as part of the design process, um, we undertake an equality assessment. Um, as well as um, looking at roads, uh, road safety assessments, um, uh, um, etc. So, but by the time things appear um, um, as a finalised design, we have went through a particular process. Um, and uh, one of the other things that we've done um, is for any new cycle route or, or corridor that we're improving um, pedestrian and cycle facilities on, um, we have put that out um, to um, public engagement. Um, where um, we place up the designs um, on the Council's website. People have got the opportunity to view those. Um, and then um, it's usually accompanied with a questionnaire. And from that questionnaire, there's opportunities to, to add additional comments um, um, on as well. So we, so we go through all of that process before things appear on the ground. So um, th there is that opportunity for, um, for everyone to make comment on it. And we do take on board um, um, those um, comments that we receive. In terms of the detail of the, the d designs, um, we tend not to get um, too many comments thinking that we're doing, doing the wrong type of design. Um, so that's, again, that's a lot of comfort 
to us as engineers that we're um, providing something that uh, people can see the benefit of. And I think as we um, sort of move forward, um, um, not just as a council, but, but, but as a um, collective society, um, if you look at where Holland was 30, 40 years ago, we are probably at that point now. And if you go to have a look at what, what their infrastructure is, um, that's something that we're trying to move, move towards and aspire to. Um, and I think the, the, the sort of comment that you made about change, um, the, the, the recent changes, not only in, in the design guidance that we are given, but the um, highway code, for example, that's changed. And all these um, new concepts are incorporated within that as well. So that's um, a way of um, changing how people behave on the road. And, and, and if, whether you're a driver, pedestrian or cyclist, you need to um, essentially abide by the highway code. And there's various traffic laws that... Uh, come into that as well. So I think um, it's a slow process, um, but it's something that we need to go through to get to where we want to be at the end of the day. Thank you. That's a, a really useful answer. And it ties into the, the point of a uh, general change in any service for neurotypical people. It might seem like very small changes, but for neurodivergent people, it can be uh, quite distressing. So thank you for that answer. Thank you. Um, it's good. I've got a couple of questions, uh, just very quick ones. Uh, firstly, seating in town centres. Has any policy been changed? Because um, every time we've had any um, requests for seating in, in areas, it's always been um, rebuffed most, more than anything else. It's been problematic. The second one is the new parking areas. Is uh, electrical charging? been a part of the decision making and a part of the plan and the zebra crossings final final quick question is about zebra crossings are, are they some i've noticed that some are raised and some are not is is there, is there a reason behind that in terms of your first point um when we are looking at um, changing a corridor over, um, and, and I can use the work that we're doing um, in Churchill Avenue, again in East Kilbride, and the reason I keep mentioning East Kilbride is because there's projects on the ground and um, um, are, are actually happening. Um, it was something that we um, looked at, um, and it's not just seating areas, um, it, um, it's trying to create a, an environment where people would be attracted to actually come and use. Um, and that's something that's slightly different from um, fr fr from an engineering perspective. Um, we're trying to not just put in facilities, but we're trying to make it attractive for um, for for people to use. So um, within um, sort of town centre environments, um, we're currently working um, up um, designs within uh, Kirkluck and Lanark, um, and the opportunity for um, not not just seating areas but cycle parking. Um, looking at um, how we can improve the aesthetics of the area, uh, we're trying to incorporate all of that within within our um, de de um, designs themselves. In terms of electric vehicle um, parking, um, we have currently got 139 dual charging points um, within South Lanarkshire. Um, we're adding to that. Um, um, fairly soon to take us closer to, to, to 150. Um, what we've undertaken so far is we've utilised the sort of, I'm going to say the public parking network. Um, so where there's a, um, a car park within a town centre, um, we've started to introduce um, electric vehicle charging points within those. We've also, this latest batch um, um, of infrastructure that we're putting in at the moment um, is looking at on-street parking. Um, and we're providing um, um, electric vehicle uh, charging units for on-street pro pro um, provision. So we've done that within certain residential areas, and that's something that we're um, keen to see the sort of take up of uh, use um, with a view to expanding that. Um, we're also um, taking forward um, a strategy and plan um, st 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 sorry, study um, with eight other um, neighbouring authorities, um, and that should be coming to to, to a conclusion um, fairly soon. Um, the sort of draft numbers of EV units that we're talking about, we're talking to, um, 
to um, introduce somewhere in the region of about 800 units um, between now and, uh, and the, end the end of the decade. Uh, and again, the locations of those um, will be carefully considered. Uh, when it comes to the new parking, um, so um, through the planning process, um, if there's um, a new supermarket, for example, then um, we're encouraging um, um, developers to, to introduce um, that kind of infrastructure uh, within their um, designs and plans as well. And that extends to residential areas as well. Um, your last point in relation to zebra crossings, um, traffic calming um, is probably um, a point where if, if there is raised features as part of um, um, a traffic calmed corridor or area, then um, and it coincides with where there's a desire line for pedestrians to use, then that's probably where uh, we would introduce a raised um, zebra crossing. Um, when we're looking at uh, crossing points, um, we, we look and see what's in the surrounding area, um, where desire lines are or could be, and we try and feed, um, f f feed the, the design features to make sure that that, that demand um, um, can be catered for. So, um, just going back to Councillor Rob's point about s slower speeds, um, all these things start to um, merge into um, one sort of larger design package when we're looking at certain corridors or certain areas within towns. OK, thank you. Uh, there's no more questions. Thank you very much, Stuart. We'll take a five-minute break and give our interpreters a break. <coughs>
<clears throat> so we get started again. Okay, we've got a um, British Sign Language update. Um, it's a verbal update by Alison Bell. Is Alison in? Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, it's a quick update on the meeting that was held with education recently. Um, just to let you know that um, following on from the uh, query that was raised at the last meeting, um, we've now found out that Calderside Academy is actually um, offering a BSL qualification to deaf and ASN pupils at the moment and they're going to make this available as part of the curriculum choice for all pupils in 2024. They are also um, providing a six weeks short course to S1 and S2 pupils. This is a taster course. And also Hamilton School for the Deaf are offering classes to parents and friends of deaf pupils. So there's quite a bit of activity that's, that's already happening. Um, there is a commitment to extend the opportunity to learn BSL to primary pupils and there's going to be some learning from the Calder side experience of delivering the BQ with a view to ex extending that as well. Um, from a workforce point of view, we offer BSL as a personal development to the workforce, to any employees who are interested in doing an accredited course. Um, this includes our modern apprentices. And recently we offered and had, I think it was 12 participants at a taster session um, from the Modern Apprentice Programme. Education will bring a paper to the meeting in June to outline what is actually happening in the schools in relation to BSL for the June meeting. Okay, that's, that's the, the brief update that I have. Okay, thank you, Alison. Um, that's a good start. That's a very good start. Uh, is is Councillor Thompson first? Uh, thanks very much, Chair. Uh, I'm very limited in my sign language, but what I can tell you through experience with my son, that these things I wish were uh, in place when he was younger. The other day, we were looking for an interpreter. He was at the court to get uh, some rights to see his children and then to get cancelled, and obviously he's very anxious, he cancelled because there was the end that the court couldn't find an interpreter. So there's still a shortage there and still a failing. And as well, at my sister's funeral last week, James left early and asked him why. And he says, because deaf people, they can't talk, they can't see, they're excluded. They're all conversation, he's sitting there in the corner of his cell. So, so it's still a, a silent world in more ways than one. And Chair, I'm delighted to hear, especially in our own area, Chair Calder said they're taking this uh, advantage to promote things and make it more aware. The more people are aware and the more people are trained, it's got to be better for everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Bert. Uh, Mark? Thanks very much. It's just a, a quick question, and I'd like to associate myself with everything that was said there by, by Bert. Um, I'm wondering, that, I think it's great that we offer uh, sign language uh, accreditation to all employees. I'm just wondering, is there anything we offer to councillors? Um, we obviously represent um, you know, the, everyone within our communities and, and uh, it would be useful, I think, even if there was a taster, you know, there was something basic, a basic level uh, of communication skills available uh, to help with residents who, who may be BSL users and, uh, you know, certainly if only to convey basic information, I think it'd be very useful. I'm just wondering if that's an option. Yeah, can I come back in there? Yes, I'll um, yes, that is something that um, we can offer. Um, if anybody's interested in having a BSL taster session, um, any elected member, if you let um, the training team know, or myself, and we can organise that. Um, and again, if it's the if anyone's interested in doing the accredited course, then we can make arrangements for that. But there is quite a commitment to the accredited courses. Alison, is it possible for um, an email to be sent out to all the members to see if there's an interest in a taster course? Yeah, we can. I can arrange that. Yep. <coughs> 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 
Thanks very much for that, Alison. Um, I'm just going to, um, our chair's got a, a frog in his throat for a moment, so I'm just going to step in. Um, thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. I'm certainly interested, I suspect others would be too. Uh, just want to bring in Councillor Ferguson. Uh, Grant, on you go. <coughs> Sorry, Grant, we'll be with you in a wee second. Uh, so we just need to bear with us. Sorry, uh, Councillor Ferguson, we've got uh, a frozen screen here, so we're trying to uh, get that sorted. No, I can't. I'm fasting. <laughs> That's a problem. Again, just to let everybody know, we are still working on, we've got a couple of technical issues here. Um, the system seems to have uh, thrown Elizabeth Ann out, which is a bit unhelpful, but um, she's working as quickly as possible to get uh, access back. So um, I'm Alison. sure we all sympathise. Yep. You know, I've had a question for Alison anyways, but while we're waiting for this. Yeah. Um, registry office, um, do we have anybody in registry offices that can sign? Because... If, if this are a guest or if it's um, the, the couple mm. that, are, that are hearing impaired, then is there a facility for that? I'm not aware that um, there, are, there is anyone in the registrar's office that's able to sign. However, if this is something that um, is made known to them, then they will make arrangements for an interpreter to be there. But I'll definitely check it out and just confirm that for you. Yep. Thanks very much. Get this off, Mo, and hand it back to you. <clears throat> no, you take. <clears throat> uh, apologies again, folks. We're still having slight issues here. Well, not so much slight issues as uh, massive issues that are completely stopping us progressing with the meeting. Um, I wonder if it might help if we took another couple of minutes break just to um, give yeah. everyone a chance. Maybe we could reboot the system or something or get IT in. So apologies to everyone again, but if you could hang on, maybe come back in another five minutes. So uh, that'd be quarter past by, by the clock in front of me. So um, thank you, everybody.
Hi all, uh, thanks very much for your patience there. Um, we seem, we think, to have got the, the problem solved, so uh, we're going to uh, resume where we left off, I think, and I'm going to go to Councillor Grant Ferguson. And uh, Sorry for the delay, Grant. Fingers crossed it works this time. There you go, Grant. That's it working now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I do have a question. Um, we were speaking about the training, the accredited training. Um, I would like to know what type of accreditation you mean, because accredited could mean um, someone has passed a sort of general course, or is it level one? Is it recognised? Um, as a recognised qualification, level one, level two. And I think it's very important in terms of public facing staff um, so that our BSL community know and can feel confident that the person they're speaking to has, um, it may be at the registry office, they're there to register a birth or um, you know, various things that can be, yeah, situations that can be stressful. Um, for anybody. So, yeah, in terms of public facing staff, I would like to know what sort of work we're doing around uh, providing uh, training uh, to those staff as well, as well as what, we, what accreditation uh, we mean when we say accredited courses. Thank you. Um, thanks for that, Grant. I'm going to bring in Alison to, to answer. Cheers. We hope. Not working. Hello. I think that's me now connected. I can only see you now, Councillor Ferguson, on the screen, nobody else. So I don't know if you're still in the meeting or not. Um, but can I just say that the accredited courses that I was referring to is level one and level two. We are an accredited centre through Signature. And um, to date, we have 92 employees who have completed level one and we have 17 who've completed level two. Um, we just finished a, an accredited level one course and last Friday we had another two employees successfully complete level one. So it's all accredited through Signature. Um, thanks and very much. Can I respond with a supplementary question, please? Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, I'm aware of uh, the signature um, the body, the accreditation body. Um, I think that it would be good to have a focus on um, progression. Um, if we um, complete one level, are we um, doing the work required to offer those candidates um, a route to progression so that they may um, um, move on to perhaps using the, the, their skills in a more professional capacity. I'd also like to mention the SQA as well um, in terms of that being a recognised qualifications body based here in Scotland. Um, is that something we'll have considered as well? Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, we'll go back to Alison and apologies if... Hello. <laughs> I'm back again. There's just me and you. Um, <laughs> we haven't looked at SQA. Um, South Lanarkshire have been a signature accredited centre for quite some years, but it's definitely something um, to consider and to have a look at. Most of the people who undertake um, BSL 
at both levels are doing it from a personal development point of view. So that's that's where we're at at the moment. Um, we did have um, sessions where we tried to bring people together who had um, completed their um, accreditation and had been awarded the certificate so that they could maintain their um, their skills um, so that it wasn't something that they were learning and then it was just put away in a drawer for the next time somebody might appear. Um, however, there, there's challenges obviously over the last couple of years about getting people into the room together to do that. But it's definitely something that we are um, we're going to look at going forward. Thank you, Alison. Alison, um, just one quick question. Um, we've got 92 employees on level one, 72 and a level two, which is excellent. That's, that's a good start. But have you thought about technology, using technology? Um, because we've got the voice to text software that will that make, make it easier for, um, say, for instance, in, in the health department, if somebody has come in and uh, there's nobody that understands or can, can have um, BSL, sign language. So would that be a possibility to, be, to investigate, to help us? Yes, that's definitely something that we can look at. We also have um, Contact Scotland, who if, if, if that case comes up, then we can um, use Contact Scotland to help us to communicate effectively with the person. OK, thank you very much. Um, there's no other questions. Thank you, Alison. Thank you for the update as well. Thank uh, you. OK, and there's no any urgent business. So I'd like to thank everyone for, for making the meeting and thank the officers as well. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks, Lucia.